son, you're going to recognize, you will begin to recognize this evening. Good evening to one another tonight. Recognize Brother Gabriel Woodside on this night. Brother Johnny and Brother Johnny Martin. Brother Francis Williams, before we take our first song, that's Brother Gabriel Woodside. Brother Johnny Martin. Brother Francis Williams. If you look at the screen, you see the pictures on the screen. No, not just the man, brother man. He's he right. Oh, no. just some green. Just some green, right. Yeah. <laughs> okay, as we get started, uh, we're going to look at the screen for our first song. We're going to look, for the, we're gonna look for the, to the screen for our first song. There's power in the blood. As you look at the screen, there's power in the blood.
church service, I pray that give them traveling mercy that they will get here, Heavenly Father, to experience your blessing. Let me pray for our friends by the way of Facebook. I pray, Lord, that they too will get a blessing. Yeah. And then we pray for those that don't know you, Lord and Savior. Under the sound of the gospel, they will accept you, Lord and Savior, before the day. Now, Heavenly Father, we pray, Lord, for your man's servant tonight. Yeah. We pray that you are anointing with power from all night. Yeah. Fill him with your Holy Spirit. Use his mouth, his feet, his hand, his entire body. I see. We we'll present the scripture tonight that we rightly divide the word of God. Lord, that be your people for peace. Let it be upon your word. Father, that we will be greater Christians than we were today and yesterday. Yeah. We'll be more on fire for you. Happy Father. And then we just pray, Lord, that you take full control of all the sin and whatever else we have that will bring glory and honor to you. May you, O oh God, and only you, yeah. get the honor, get the glory, Hallelujah. have me part for us. You and only you, we serve. Yeah. Blessed be the name of the Lord our God, the Most High. Yeah. For these things we pray in Jesus' precious name. Amen. 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 standing and join us in saying, there is a sweet anointing in this sanctuary. Amen. And we'd like to dedicate this song to Brother Martin on this, his day. And the Francis that we are honoring today, the Martin, the Francis, and the Benedictine.
you have to travel. God is there. Hey, even, even when the when the skies are bright, when the pathway is clear and smooth, God is still there. He's there for us all days. I mean, you truly give the Lord thanks for that. Hey, Amen. 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 Okay, tonight on behalf of our pastors, we want to welcome each and every one of you to our fourth night of our church anniversary service, and it is our privilege to have you with us. We're going to ask is there anybody who can talk to by show of hands? Yeah, anybody who's it's your first night out with us tonight. Anybody? Amen. 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 Okay. You want to make sure that you feel welcome. And that hey, and I can say, like I said, I think it was Monday night. If you haven't gotten a handshake or a greeting, uh, after the service you come to uh, make sure you have know, invite, invite all of you to stand with us to be saying, there's a Christian welcome here at Tabernacle Baptist Church. Amen. Amen. To stand with us to be saying this welcome song. Yeah. So we're going to get them together so they're going to dedicate this um, 
to a special class this evening.
Right, so I'll come. He'll be. Let's talk about my last time my boy leave, leave his own home. And uh, instead of them paying attention while the teaching is going on, they're fighting us trying to know the, the past where you know, pay attention to preaching. You know, you have to, you have to take it serious. And then you get me, I don't want you to be back here and say it now. You know, we need to let them leave these cell phones home. And uh, let them learn about the Bible and the things of God. Yes, sir. Church, not just financially, 
of that time, the blood, sweat, and tears that was bring Tabernacle Baptist Church to where it is uh, to, uh, today. And uh, they have left such a legacy and an imprint on us. And that has been an encouragement to all of us to continue uh, to serve the Lord. And I mean, uh, we, we just want enough to give them for all that they have done for us. We, we know that heaven uh, will be worth it all. And uh, when they get to heaven, God will reward them for the work that they have done here on earth. And uh, to tell you something about, uh, especially Brother, I mean, Brother Martin, Brother Gable, and uh, Brother Francis, uh, long serving members of this church, uh, Brother, Martin, I mean, Brother Martin and Brother Francis. Man, I can't tell you the last time Brother Francis and Brother Martin has not been in church. And anytime Brother Martin is not here, you know that he's not feeling well. But they are faithful, they are staple in this church. Yeah. And I remember the night that Sister Martin called the pastor outside to lead Brother Martin to the Lord. And ever since he trusted the Lord Jesus as Savior, he's been here. And I yeah. being here. And I listen to Brother Martin. Yet, but he never gave up on him. 
I saw a lady came by, trying and keep trying. She told her I spoke many dreams. I will let you know. At home, we will have our devotion and we will join and you will join us, but never have anything to say. Our holy son, Vincent, always tried to talk to him about the Lord. Until one Sunday night, when I went home from church, he was waiting for me. He said, I am ready. I asked him for what? He said, just go and get what I need. I'm ready to get saved. That was all he said. I said, okay, I could be with the Lord. He said, no, I promise you the way when I'm ready, I will call him. And that was in October 19, 1990, at 9.30. He was led to the Lord by Pastor Mistral and also three of my sons. A few weeks later, So we'll take, we'll take two for one. But thank God uh, we got saved. 
and uh, he came here and uh, he's being set to be brought into the church. He's always faithful. Now, you see him there? He ain't no 60, 70 year old boy. He's a full grown 80 plus man.
then when I see you step aside the car and you're driving, and uh, he's not only a great preacher, uh, he's perfect with judo, judo and jiu jitsu. Jiu jitsu. Jiu jitsu, he does already. So, what color belt? Brown belt. Right now. Brown belt. He's trying to get the black belt in jiu jitsu. I don't mind the belly of baby, I can understand. <laughs>
He said, Jesus has no predecessor and he'll have no successor. I thought, hmm, my goodness. And then he started talking about a story in the Bible about that leper that Jesus healed. And some of you may remember the story. He told the leper, he said, don't tell anybody what I've done for you. He said, just go privately and show it. But I thought about that myself. And of course, he didn't keep it private. But I thought about that myself. I thought, what would happen if Jesus were to heal me of the most deadly disease of my day? How could I not tell everybody about that? I took a pen out and I started to write the words of this song here. That's where it came from. It said, how could I not tell what he's done for me? How does a prisoner not shout, I'm free? How does a beggar not say he's found bread? How can I not tell in spite of what he said? Right. Well, I was going good, eh? <laughs> That's what I listened to all week. 
she got a break from me. I didn't get out of that. And uh, I, got, I guess we couldn't write right where we could go. But I should, when I saw Brother Norris today, I should have said, my sick, I'm back on the head. <laughs> <laughs> and so, and, uh, trying to remember all that stuff from last time I was here. How many of you were here last time I was here?
That means it's almost over, but it ain't over yet. Let's see what the Lord has for us tonight. Nehemiah chapter 6, the Bible says, Now it came to pass, when Sandal and Tobiah and Geshur, the Arabian, and the rest of our enemies heard that I had built the wall, that there was no breach left therein, though at the time I had not set up the doors upon the gate. You already preached about people on my coat. Yeah. Okay, I'm just trying to follow Brother Woodside here. And uh, take off my coat and in a few minutes I'm going to follow, follow Brother Norris and take off my tie too. So, I didn't know I could be liberal in this church, but now that I know that, no. But, uh, the Bible says this, verse number two, and Sam, Battle, and Geshem sent unto me, saying, Come, let us meet together in some one of the villages in the plain of, what's that word? Oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, no. I should have told them something right there. The Bible says, but they thought to be mischief, and, they, and I sent messengers to them, saying, I'm doing great work, so that I cannot come down. Why should the work cease while I, whilst I leave it and come down to you? Yet they sent to me four times after this sort. And I answered them after the same manner. Then Sandal and his servants said unto me, like that a fifth time, with an open letter in his hand, whereon it is written and is reported among the heathen, and Gashmu saith it, that thou and the Jews think to rebel, for which cause thou buildest a wall, that thou mayest be their king, according to these words. And thou hast also appointed prophets to preach of thee at Jerusalem, saying, There is a king in Judah. And thou shalt be reported to the king. This is King Artaxerxes. According to these words, come now therefore, let us take counsel together. Then I said unto them, said, there is no such thing done as thou sayest, for thou fainest out of thine own heart. For they all made us afraid, saying, their hands shall be weakened from the word. What about that? That it be not done. Now therefore, O God, strengthen my hands. I'll preach you tonight on this. Saying no, no, the whole no. I say no, no, the whole no. With the help of God, we'll preach for a little while and we'll go and uh, we'll go to fellowship. Father, we love you. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you, Lord, for this good church. Thank you for the faithfulness of these men and these ladies behind them. And thank you for those that have just been here time after time and day after day and week after week, month after month and year after year, just in their place serving you. God, I pray that you'd help me to be a challenge to them tonight, and many of them are, are here recently, and many of them have even been invited tonight to visitors. Father, you know the need of everybody here to the sound of my voice right now. I pray, God, that you would do what only you can do, and that's meet every one of those needs. Some need to be challenged, some need to be chastened, some need to be corrected, some may need even comfort here tonight. So, Father, I pray that you would help us in the Word of God. I certainly do need you. I'm tired. It's been a long day. I've traveled uh, three flights just to even get here. God, you know my mind is tired. Uh, my hands are be a little frayed. My nerves are. God, I thank you that you're a God that hears and answers prayer. Yeah. Thank you that you're a God that when we are weak, you are indeed strong. Yeah. I pray tonight, God, that you get into yeah. service. And I pray that you do something yeah. that only you can explain. I pray that after we're done, Lord, if there's any lost in this building, this will be the last service they sent through as a lost boy, a lost girl, yeah. lost man or woman. Father, I pray that if there's a, a man in here who's cold and distant away from you, I pray that you draw him closer to you. Tonight. We give you praise and glory for anything that happens in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. You may be seated tonight. Amen. To so understand the context of this scripture tonight, you've got to understand what's going on right now. The children of Israel are in captivity. They have now been taken over by the Medo Persian Empire that Babylon came in first, the Assyrians came in at some other time, and now they're under the Medo Persian Empire and under the King Artaxerxes. And Nehemiah comes to him and he says, my heart is broken over the children of Israel. He said, I saw Jerusalem and the walls are broken down. And he said, I, I, I looked at him and he was weeping about it, much like Jeremiah the prophet did after a while. And Jeremiah said, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. And he cried over that city. He said, oh, God, it needs to be rebuilt." By the way, I think, I, think, I think somewhere along the way, again, we gotta start, we got we to weep for our nation. Yeah, yeah. Right? Somebody somewhere, Jeremiah said this, old oh, that my head were as a fountain and my eyes as a fountain of tears. He was heartbroken about what he saw was going on. Mm -hmm. And somebody somewhere is going to have to get heartbroken for the Bahamas and heartbroken for the United States and heartbroken for Canada and heartbroken for the nations that someday will be turned into hell and all those that forget God. According to Psalm chapter 9, verse 17. They're under this big old 
Persian rule. And his heart is broken. He says, we got to, just like Jeremiah's heart was broken, just like Ezra's heart later was broken to rebuild the temple, Nehemiah came along and said, my heart is broken over the walls of Jerusalem. He began to seek leave from the king and say, king, can I rebuild the wall? King Artaxerxes, because Nehemiah had served him well, he gave him leave and he said, I'll let him go to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. Began to rebuild. Much like you and I, when we begin to build something for God, all of a sudden the enemy creeps out the cracks, don't they? Okay. Mm -hmm. I'll never forget it. When I got saved, before I got saved, most of you don't believe it. And I often share my testimony with people in church. They don't even believe I'm a bus kid sometimes. I was in Bible college, nobody believed I was even a bus kid. Uh, and I, and I, I'm telling you, they, they don't know us a lot of times before we got saved. They just see the man up here preaching in the suit and the tie. They just see somebody sitting over here. They don't see the miserable wretch that God saved years ago. And I'll tell you, if I got saved, man, nobody wanted anything to do with me before I got saved. I was so bad in school, and they were arguing. I didn't think I was in the first school when I was in third grade. They looked at me and they said, We got to get him out of here. They sent me to another school. They said, He, he needs to be educated. They were right. I was, I was, getting, I was born in school. I had a memory that was just like, You just say it to me. And it was just like, It was, it was on. And that was it. And I started making trouble. And they sent me to another school. My grandmother said, Have him tested. I think he's born in school. She was right. They sent me to an advanced class. It was called the Program for the Academic and the Talented. And I went to there, the same thing started happening. Started seeing those things, folks just getting like that, and started acting a fool in school again. Nobody wanted anything to do with me. I remember them sending me to the school psychologist's office. First, they sent me to the principal's office, and she got sick of me. <laughs> then they sent me to the assistant principal's office, and she got sick of me. Then they sent me to the school psychologist, and they tried to figure out, you know, if we give him up to psychobabble to him, maybe it'll help him. But let me tell you, psychobabble can never do what Jesus can do. Right. 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 They started to counsel and give me things in my life, and, and everybody, oh, Calvin's so terrible, oh, he's, he, he's wicked, he's doing all this thing. But then something happened. I got saved. Exactly. March 1st, 1993. Amen. All of a sudden, when I got saved and started living for God, oh, my, the enemy just came out of the woodwork. Now the same people before that were complaining that I was a demon child, and now the people that were complaining, all my aunts and uncles, now they say, oh, you go to church too much now. You ever heard that one? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Somebody somewhere here. <laughs> well, you go to church too much now. Well, wait a minute, you were complaining when I was going to the principal's office too much earlier. My husband, he's down on Thursday night at the church. Remember you were used to complaining he was down at the bar Thursday night? When God begins to change a person's life, many times, hey, hey, you used to worry about him running around. Now you don't want him to come to men's breakfast because it might cramp your style on prayer breakfast on Wednesday because it may cramp your style. It may mess up your weekend plans. Watch you say, hey, praise God, he's going to church. What happens? You start looking for God, those enemies come out of the woodwork. Yeah. I'll never forget a man got saved in our, in our mission conference at our church. I told you somebody's going to get a workout tonight. <laughs> <laughs> Hope you ate your Wheaties this morning. <laughs> I like to move it, man. And, uh, but he, he got saved at our church on our Christmas conference. And there was a preacher named Lyle Dines. Not Lyle Dines, but he was, he was a Terry Dines. He's a missionary uh, from Florida, matter of fact. And uh, he, was, he was a missionary for years in Brazil. And unfortunately, he came back to Brazil. His, his wife was actually killed in a car accident. I believe they were in Florida. Matter of fact, somebody, somebody put a grill in the back of his truck. And going down the highway, that grill flipped off. And he hit it and tried to avoid it and flipped over and killed his wife instantly. Oh. But years ago, they were they were at our church and he led a man to Christ out of the park. This boy, man, he got saved. So the guy had to leave early. And we had one more night of church. And he invited that man to come in. And that man came into church drunk as a scum. Here's how he came. He had a gospel track in his hand. He said, where... Where is, where is Terry Dye? That's how he came to church. Oh, man. Now, where is Terry Dye? He, here's what he said. He said, I want to give this back to him. He said, why are you giving it back to him? He said, because ever since I got saved, everything's going wrong. <laughs> <laughs> As the young people say, sometimes they be like that. Sometimes it is that way. You know why? Because when you got saved, you change teams. Right. Yeah. And the devil doesn't like it when you change teams on him. Yeah. 
The devil, man, I remember being under the grip of Satan in my life. I remember uh, reading about black magic and white magic and, and trying to do things and get involved with spiritism before I got saved. And Satan didn't like losing one of his team members. Satan always rears his head to head up. The Bible says something unusual happened. Said that it. Tobiah, Geshe, Geshmu, Shemaiah, the story in a minute here. All these enemies begin to come out of the woodwork to eat us in the front of the farm. What do you want know they were saying, Jeremiah? Nehemiah, we got some distractions for you. I want you to just come down to us. And instead of focusing on the work of God, and instead of focusing on revival, and instead of reviving the work in the midst of the years, instead of, like he talked about in chapter 4, what do these people do? Will they make it in the day? Will they revive the stones? Instead of working about all that work for God, why don't you just come down and meet with us in the plain of all I'm going to tell you, as I travel my country, and I'm pretty sure tonight, I traveled the country of Canada many times, but before the pandemic, I was in Canada every other month. Spent a lot of time up there. I preached all the way up in the Arctic Circle. Said, what were you doing up there? I don't know. <laughs> Brown people are supposed to stay right around the equator. <laughs> no idea what they had me doing up there, preaching to a bunch of Eskimos and everything else. <laughs> we're supposed to do what I told you when I traveled this country. I believe one of the number one reasons, if not the number one reason why we don't experience personal revival, family revival, church revival, and national revival is because most Christians are distracted people. Right. Yeah. We're so focused on everything else but God. Yeah. We got, we're consumed with everything else but revival. Yeah. We're consumed with everything else but his word. We're consumed with everything else but prayer. And Satan has done a fantastic job of getting us distracted from the work of God. One of the biggest things that we're dealing with in the United States of America is distracted driving. You know what I'm talking about? Young people, what age can they get their license here? You gotta wait till 18? <laughs> and Louisiana, they destroyed that when you were 12. No, but <laughs> distracted driving. Here's one of the biggest campaigns going on right now in the United States of America. All my, I got a lot of friends who are police officers and U.S. Marshals and other things and involved with the government. The biggest thing, and you know this is true, is distracted driving. Don't text and drive. They say it all the time. Every one of you parents, teach your kids how to drive. What's it? Don't text and drive. You know why? It's distracted driving. When I was in Bible college, we, I was going to say we did some of the stupidest things, but you know, that was like last week too. But anyways, no, we did some of the stupidest things when we were in Bible college. One of my friends, he was my bus captain, he used to read the newspaper as he was driving. Now it was Texas, so it wasn't as busy, but I mean, I, I'm thinking, I mean, I want to see Jesus, but not today. <laughs> He's reading the newspaper as he's driving. He's eating as he's driving. One of my buddies, he was raised in the same church as I was, he, he got one of those power converters and he put a toaster right in his seat. I mean, he could drive down the street and put, make toast right there. <laughs> then he even got more detailed. He went up, he upgraded from the toaster and put a microwave right next to him. He could make a hot pocket on his way to college in the morning. Crazy. Distracted driving. And I'll tell you, one thing, we may look at that and we make sure our kids aren't distracted, don't we? We talk to them about texting and driving. We talk to them about not going on Facebook Live and driving. We talk about social media. We talk about not having your friends distract you. We talk about not, not playing around with anything. And yet most of us living in this world today, we live a distracted Christian life. Amen. And think nothing of it. Notice some things about distractions. I want you to notice, first of all, the thing about the distractions in this passage here. This isn't the message. I've got three points at the end that we're going to the house. 
Distractions come to those that are busy for God. You ever notice the, the moment you decide to go to church, all of a sudden something happens. Yeah. All of a sudden you get that phone call from somebody. Hey, why don't you go over and let's go do this and this. I'm talking about the very moment. Some of you tonight, and some aren't here tonight because somebody somewhere called them up and got their eyes off Jesus Christ, got their eyes off the work of the Lord. I'm not talking about, listen, there's, there's some legitimate excuse, there's some legitimate reasons why you may not be here tomorrow, might even. And I'm not faulting you for that. But I'm just saying, some of the things we're allowed to distract us are so petty. Yeah, that's right. That's the way to revive that God wants to bring in our hearts. And it always comes to those that are busy in the work of God. You let somebody go to youth camp somewhere. I guarantee you this, the devil shows up that next week. You let some husband decide he's going to be the husband that God wants him to be. And I promise you that night he'll have a fight about something. You let some young person decide, I'm going to follow God with my life. And I'm going to get right with God. And I'm going to get saved. And I promise you, that very night, Satan's going to come to them in the form of a distraction. on that bottle. Nobody, nobody in your family said, matter of fact, they complained about how much you used to drink. They complained about you when you got high. They complained about you when you were running around. They complained about everything else. And now that you got religion, now that you got Jesus, man, don't go overboard on this thing. How many times have I seen a husband get saved? His wife, much like you, wanted her husband to get saved. One woman, she came to our church, her husband got saved. He started tithing. He started giving the missions. And she said, I, don't want, I wanted you to get saved, but not that saved. <laughs> Come on, that's how we are sometimes. And honey, I wanted you to get saved. I didn't want you to start you know, tithing in church saved. I didn't want you to start talking about Jesus everywhere we go is kind of saved. I just wanted you to stop abusing me. I just wanted you to stop cussing me out. I just wanted you to stop starting random fights with me. I didn't want you to get that saved. Satan is going to start distracting those of you. Those of you that have already determined you're going to be in revival tomorrow night, I'm going to tell you what's going to happen. Somebody's going to call you tonight. Somebody's already going, you've already determined, I'm, I'm coming Sunday, I'm going to tell you tonight. Satan's going to try to use something in your life to distract you away from being all that God wants you to be. I want you to understand this about uh, distractions in this passage right here. It always comes from the wrong crowd. It always comes from the wrong crowd. The crowd that's trying to kill the revival that's always been going on this week. It's the wrong crowd. The crowd that's trying to get you away from the word of God is the wrong crowd. Hey, my friend, and that crowd will distract you from doing the work of God. Watch this. Distractions always lead in a downward direction. Have you ever been, have you been to Israel at all? I was, you said Israel before. Twice. I'm, I was supposed to go to Israel last November. I'm supposed to leave on my one son's birthday, come back on my other son's birthday. It ended up getting canceled because Omicron came through. And seven people out of 11 million had it, so they had to come to be honest. And, uh, but my church went the year before. Matter of fact, we were one of the last flights out of Israel to go to the Central Gold Coast last summer. My pastor and the, the chairman of our deacons, our head deacon and our mission director, they preached through the pictures of being in Israel for about four weeks. They just preached through them. It was unbelievable. I cannot wait to set my foot in Jerusalem. But here's what we know about Jerusalem. Your pastor can confirm this tonight. Jerusalem is a city that sits on a hill. And by the way, that's why Jesus said, yeah, I, 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 when he was talking to the disciples about being a Christian, he said, listen, a city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and hide it under a bushel. And he talked about that. He was talking about the city of Jerusalem there. And, and, by, and so the city that Nehemiah was coming to, he was building up the wall thereof. This was a high place. This was an exalted place. This is a place that had a standard about it. And anywhere that they could leave from that place would be in a downward direction. I say to you tonight, Mom and Dad, anywhere you go from the will of God for your life is a downward place. I say to you young people in this room, anywhere you go away from the word of God and the people of God and the will of God for your life, it is always a downward place. Nobody follows the devil and goes up around the right, 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 right. 
And amazing, that man that was stripped and of his clothing and his raiment, he was on that, he was on that uh, road where he found the good Samaritan, but he was on that Jericho road. And it's amazing, the Bible says this, a certain man went down from Jerusalem to right, Jericho. Is that right? Listen to the young person. Young men, whether it's a freak of faith or a set of hips, I'm going to tell you right where it's going to lead you. It's going to lead you down. Tell you, young ladies, whether it's a smooth talking young man, whether it's somebody that convinced you to lose, to, to give away your purity tonight, whether it's somebody that calls you to leave church tonight, it's never going to lead you in a better direction. It's never going to lead you in a more positive direction. We better wise up tonight. We better wake up tonight and understand the devil wants to wreck our lives. He wants to ruin our lives. He wants to kill the revival that's already started in you this week by allowing you to get distracted. Yeah. Yeah. He doesn't come to us with the most wicked thing ever. See, Satan doesn't always distract with sin. It can be selfishness. It can be, it can be silliness. It can be things that we ought to be doing already, but it never ought to take the place of what God is doing in our heart and lives. Yeah, right, right. Yeah. Always leads us in a sound direction. I want you to notice this about these distractions. What did he say? He said they sent once. Then he said they sent four times after the same hand. And then he said, not only that, they came a fifth time with an open letter in their hands. Yeah. Oh. Didn't you wish when you decided you were going to have victory over some sin? Didn't you wish it never came back? Don't you wish once you told the devil no, he just stayed away from you? And nothing ever happened again? Didn't you wish when you decided you were going to give up that bottle? Give up that pill popping. Give up that wrong crowd. Don't you wish everything would just stop right there and boy, you could just have the victory one time? Listen, if that's you tonight and you did that, fantastic. I'm going to sit down and let you come up here and preach. But that's not my story or my song. I want you to know tonight the distractions of Satan are persistent. And that's why you can walk in out tonight dedicate whatever you want to dedicate right here and I guarantee you, by the time you get back to that pew, Satan will be whispering in your ear that it wasn't worth it. Let him realize that tonight. Be persistent. The thing that has been killing revival in your home, listen to me, it's going to show up tomorrow morning too. It's amazing. That's why Jesus said, give us this day our daily bread. It's amazing that as he gives us daily prayer example that he gave us in Matthew chapter 6 and in Luke chapter 11, he spoke on daily, on daily, on daily. And in the same verses, he mentions, lead us not into temptation. Why? Because he knew that temptation was persistent. Right. I want you to understand this about distractions. They're always accompanied with a lie. They're always accompanied with a lie. That was a pretty good liar. Matter of fact, I believe it was John chapter 8 and verse number 44 that says of the, of the Pharisees, you are of your father the devil, and the lust of your father you will do, for he was a murderer from the beginning, and is a liar. And watch what he said. He is the father of all lies. All right, all right, all right. Back where I'm from, here's what the, here's what the old timers used to say. The devil is a liar. Yeah. How many heard that growing up? You ever heard that? Yeah. Yeah. The devil is a liar. All right. So then. He thinks, yeah, he's still here. Yeah. Hallelujah. <laughs> some of you need to some of you need to say that to him when he starts whispering in your ear, too. Yeah. The devil is a liar. Yeah. I, I'm thinking about stopping going to church. The devil is a liar. Because yeah. right. somebody whispered in your ear that told you if you didn't go to church, you'd be better off. Well, I spent years and years without God. I'll tell you right now, I wasn't better off. I'll never forget one time we got together. Some of those kids that went to elementary school, I got, I got kicked out of the second school in sixth grade, but I got saved in my sixth grade year. One of those girls, we grew up and all of us we went our separate ways, and we went and we just, uh, just lost track of each other. She is now the, one of the medical examiners of uh, the Milwaukee County Coroner. She does autopsies. Weird. But she makes a lot of money. Yeah. And I'll never forget, we got together at a restaurant. A whole bunch, a bunch of us from that, from that time period all graduated uh, sixth grade together. 
She stood there. She just shook her head.
Unfortunately, the enemy will meet their doom. Yeah, I remember Sister Kelly singing that song, I pray we'll all be ready. Yeah. I'll never forget it. We were, we were, I was just talking to him about this afternoon. When I was here in April, when we were, uh, we were over here in the West End, I think somebody called us. And I asked him, we were coming around a certain place where he said the guy used to play as kids, as a matter of fact. And he said, I would come around a certain place and I asked him, I said, Brother Norris, uh, Mr. Bain, I said, I said, when was the last time there was a hurricane? Now watch me, this was in April. I said, when was the last time a major hurricane hit the Bahamas? And I forget how long before that he had said. And I'm talking about from April to August. That short little time period. All of a sudden, many folks lost their lives. Tragic. Looks like today, many people, they have their health issues even to this day. Some of my favorite preachers have health issues today. But many of us, instead of letting God use it, we have allowed Satan to use it. And instead of us drawing nigh to God, Losing away from him. There, they tell us that the statistics tell us in the United States of America right now that 15% of the people will never come back to church again after this pandemic. And I mean church after church after church that's struggling today. I mean ministry after ministry after ministry that's struggling today. Why? Because 15% of our people are distracted. That's only the count of the ones that fell out. That isn't even count for the ones that sit in church every week and are distracted. No. I hid behind the pulpit last night when I was preaching in, in Canada. I might have to hide behind it tonight again. Preacher. I mean, somebody that through the last two years. I've listened, I've heard everybody, I've listened to all the, I've listened to this side of the person who said, other people say it's not real. I mean, say, say it's real, we should never come out of our house again. There's opinions everywhere. They're all floating around, but I'm going to tell you what most of them are. They're just distractions. And anything that gets our eyes off Jesus Christ, anything that gets our eyes off of the gospel, anything that gets our eyes off of discipling people and seeing lives change and marriages put back together and young people help, listen, that don't go to essence and destruction. Say no, no to oh no is what I'm saying tonight. Amen. Amen. Because here's what we told ourselves. Here's what we told ourselves. I'll read my Bible when I have more. Well, you had all the time in the world. Did you read it? <laughs> but Alan, I, I would pray if I had more. <clears throat> you had all the time in the world. Did you pray? Brother Allen, you know, I gotta work all these hours. You know, if I didn't work all these hours, then I would spend time with my kids. The hours got cut. You only spend time with your bad kids. <laughs> you know what I like the pandemic the most? Because some of these had to, they, they gotta put up with our teachers. Put up with for years. Now you got to spend all day with your rock kid. <laughs> well, I, well, I, I, I work on my marriage for the hour if I had the time. Okay, COVID gave you time. What do you do with it? Yeah. Still didn't have a family altar. We still didn't pray together. We didn't read the Bible together. Tell me we're not distracted. Yeah. But guess what? We put in more hours on social media than we ever have. Yeah. Yeah. We're, we're, listen, I, I, and I, 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 I don't have to be on it, but I'm on, I'm on Facebook and Twitter and, and, and Instagram and Marco Polo and WhatsApp now. And y'all got to get together. 
and uh, and all these different. We're on all these different things, aren't we? And we're getting less done for God than we ever have. Yeah. And we're experiencing less revival than we ever have. Right. God gave you all this time. I'm gonna get us preachers here in a minute. Here's what Brother Johnson, Brother Johnson right? Just on the ride here, we laughed 14 times, so that's good. We're going to get along well. I, I had a preacher, I was preaching with him, and uh, we were in Illinois together preaching. And he's a man I respect, he's a man I love. Matter of fact, I was telling you, if my church blew up tomorrow, and I had to go to church within two hours of my church, I'd be in that man's church. And he, got, and he got up, and he sounded like a whiny country song when he got up. Oh, and it's fair. Everything's wrong. You think you're gonna go to hell in a handbasket? It's terrible. It's terrible. It's terrible. That was the gist of the message. Real encouraging. And it was like all these other preachers. Oh, you gotta, oh, you gotta hang in there. You gotta hang in there. And I got up. And we all were hanging there, by the way. But I got up after him, and I preached this very message. God started giving me something about preaching. God said, say on, Galvin. So I say it on. I said, you know, us preachers, us independent preachers, here's what we've been preaching on and ripping about for years. We've been saying to our people, let's God know, you got to worry about more about God than a football game on Sunday. And y'all know some of you don't come to Sunday night church because there's a football game. And some of your kids don't come to midweek service because they're in a little league game. And these bunch of churches are compromising. And all they got their ball machines and their laser shows. And you know what God did? God took all of that away. God answered everything we've been complaining about. God shut down the football games. God shut down the little leagues. God shut down every distraction. And instead of saying, glory to God, let's keep turning our eyes back on Jesus, we complained about it. God took away the laser shows. God took away the praise. God took, God took away all of it. He took away the ball machine. And there was nothing left but an old man of God, an old fashioned man of God. And there was nothing left. Songwriter put it this way. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Yeah. Oh, it's wonderful things. And the things, the social media, the political talk, the opinions of this world, the opinions of fellow Christians, the sports taking over our lives, the things of this earth will grow strangely dim. Before I'll say it again, I think the greatest hindrance to revival in our church is distracting Christians. We got so much junk on us that God couldn't send in revival if He wanted to. Because our lives are so full of junk, we have nowhere to put it. What if a group of people come out and say, Oh, oh, I want to invite some others. Nothing between my soul and the Savior. Out of this world's elusive dream, nothing prevents elusive, elusive and favor. Keep the wind there. Nothing gets in the Whatever happened to that song, I Surrender? Or some? Oh. Or I Surrender 75%? Oh. Oh, I'll give him 90%. You know, I'll give him Saturday morning. I, I'll give him, you know, Saturday sometime. I'll give him, I'll give him both Sundays in here. Bible will start to happen when you get rid of the junk and just give it all out. You say, I am thine, O Lord, and I have chosen thy voice. I have told thy love to me. Yeah. I long to rise in the arms of faith and be closer drawn to thee. Draw me near, near, blessed Lord, to the cross where thou hast died. All the purity light of a single hour that before thy throne I spend. When I kneel in prayer to thee, my God, I can hear that spirit. And so this is the close. Here's, here's the message. Go back. How do we deal with these distractions? Number one, we find a way to God. We 
He said, I'm not entertaining Sandel and Tobiah. Geshem, or Shemaiah. Some of you today, one of the things that can bring the greatest revival in your life is to get away from some of the crowd you've been running with. Because they're doing nothing more than distracting you from being all that God wants you to be. And I don't care how many messages you can preach by this good man, by these good men up here, if you are running with the crowd, listen to me tonight, you run with dogs long enough, you're going to start to get fleas. Some of you have been running dogs long enough. Some of you, the reason why some of you in this room are not saved is because you keep running with people that are preaching bad doctrine and they're not preaching that book right here. And you're listening to every other voice than the Holy Ghost of God that's telling you you are a sinner and you need to trust Jesus Christ as your Savior. Yeah. There's one voice you need to hear, and that's the voice of Jesus Christ calling you to repentance. Amen. 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 Satan loves to send in his press. What about this guy? What about this new book of the Bible? What about this religion? Listen, you got to cut through all that junk because neither is there salvation in any other. For there is none other name, another name given among men whereby we must be saved. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by him. You better listen. If you're distracted by anything else other than Jesus, you're going straight to hell, and he wants to save you and take you straight to heaven tonight. You better find a great crowd. You better listen to that crowd that's preaching that book. You young people, you better hang around that crowd that loves Jesus. Yeah. That's old folks. We better hang around that crowd that loves Jesus. Yeah. You're, listen, if, you're, if, 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 if somebody in your life right now, you know it. You know it as soon as I'm standing here. They've been distracting you. Some of you won't even get right with God. Some of them will never walk the aisle because of somebody else sitting in the auditorium. And they're, I've, I've been there as a teenager, worried about what the girl I liked across the auditorium was going to think if I walked that aisle. What would she think if I surrendered to preach? Thank God there was a day in my life where I said, hang that junk. I'm going forward with Jesus. Yeah. Yeah. Some of you need to make that decision tonight. Some of you, a job is keeping you away from the will of God. Some of you, listen, it's your own thoughts and your own mind and your own plans. Find a great crowd. Number two, find a great work. Find a great work. Nehemiah said this. He's not doing great work. I said, but what does teach when I come down? I, like, I think he said it was a little bit added to you. Why should I come down to you? You know why some of you are easily distracted? Because you're not doing anything. And I don't mind is the devil's workshop. And some of you say, I don't have a, I, don't, I, I have a great crowd, but you don't have a great work. You know, I've never met a pastor yet. I've never met a pastor yet that just had a really good week that turned into some nasty good week that they could have. I mean, have you ever had to turn anybody with some head? There's just too many people volunteering at the church. <laughs> I don't know what to do with all these people. You know what's easy? We call it the 80 20 rule 20% of the people doing 80% of the work. And it's amazing. It's amazing. Those that are always have their hands busy in the work of God, they're the same ones that are God's touching. Maybe it's because I've got hands to plow. So what's a great work? But I, here's what we think a great work is. We think it's preaching behind a pulpit. We think it's singing a special. And I pray God, I do both. Am I against some obvious? You know what a great work is? Teaching the first grade boy Sunday school class. You know what a great work is? Cooking and being a blessing to men on Saturday. So they can come and be focused on prayer instead of other things. You know what a great worker is? When a church needs a nursery worker, you do it. You know what a great work is? Somebody signing and being a blessing to those that are in the bed. That's a great work. He said, listen, I'm too busy to go down there. Listen, you guys can talk about at work. They may they can talk about whatever they want to at work. Listen, I'm too busy to consume the things of God. You guys, you guys go criticize your boss all you want to. You criticize whatever you want to. Listen, I got my eyes fixed on him. I'm going to find a great work. You know, everybody in here, if you are part of this church, you are, the Bible says he put the church together like a body. And there's no useless parts of the body. And there are no useless parts of the church. God put you here because you have a function in the church. Now, they have a pastor. 
They have a piano player. That's not your function. But you have a function in the church. Right. Maybe it's just being a faithful man of God supporting the man of God. Maybe it's just being there saying, amen, when the preacher's preaching, and this heart says, thank God, I'm not alone. And you encourage the man of God. That's a great work. Maybe you just, you're the lady that when somebody has a baby in the church, you make a meal for somebody. See, you know what Jesus said? If you even give out a cup of water, Tell your neighbor about Jesus. And I'm saying, you got to find a great work last week on Day Sunday. He said, Oh man, you got to do this. And we can hear the liberty. He said, Oh God, strengthen my hands for the work. Or say, I'm strengthening my hands for the work. Oh God, I need your strength. I need your power. Watch this. I like these verse 13. Look at that. So the wall is set. And wouldn't it be great to look back at the, at the end of this week? Somebody. Let me go check out Ono. Let's see what's going on down there. Maybe they got some new ideas. Maybe that crowd isn't what I what that pastor, what that narrow-minded preacher told me. I'm gonna just go down there and hang out with that crowd for a while. Let's go try to see what they're doing down there. Here's what's gonna happen.
You sound a Christian. I'm saved. I'm born again. If the word of God spoke to my heart, some junk has to go. I'm going to ex experience revival this week. Some junk has to go. I told you, Brother Allen, Brother Johnson, Brother Johnson, and Brother Silver this week have not brought a revival in their suitcase. A revival takes place. It's going to be because you are yielded to the Holy Ghost of God. And ask Him to break up the foul grounds of your heart so that the Word of God can take root in them. And so you said there's some job that needs to go. Why don't you come? You know they still the COVID, but we can stand apart and come to this old fashioned altar tonight. Why don't you come? Some job has to go. You said some job has to go. You're in the shadow of the doubt, the word of God spoke to my heart. Why don't you come tonight and say some jump has to go? Some jump definitely have to go. If I'm going to be, I'm going to experience individual revival. We are going to experience corporate revival. Why don't you raise your hand and say some jump has to go so I can pray for you? I see that hand. I see that hand. I see that hand. I see that hand saying some jump has to go. Father, you see the hands. Indicate some pains up to go in their life. In order for them to be what you want them to be. Yeah. Lord, it is asked that you would move in those lives. Pray that you would save the lost one. Thank you for the preaching of your way. Thank you for the opportunity of every. Move by your spirit now. In Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Thank you so much, Dr. Allen, um, for the word of God tonight. So right now, I want to ask uh, Pastor Michael all to come and dismiss us in prayer. So happy to see Brother Michael and his, some of his church people here tonight. Um, Brother Michael actually led me to the Lord. Amen. Well, you remember that. <laughs> but what Brother, Brother Haynes said, he said, He saved me. Yeah. He didn't do that. But he led me to the Lord, showed me how to be born again. Amen. And I've always been a Christian of the Catholic faith. Come, Brother Michael, and dismiss us. Once more, Lord, we come forward to the throne of grace where we can obtain mercy and find grace to help, O God, Lord, in time of need. We thank you tonight, O God, for your wonderful words that went forth tonight, Lord, for the heart that you have spoken to. Lord Jesus, I pray, God, that there be somebody, God, who responds to your word. And for those things that are in their life that they need to let go, that they will let go and let God. Tonight, Lord, we thank you for the fellowship. We thank you for the preacher. And we ask tonight, Lord, as we go to a separate home, may you go with us, Lord, protect us along the highways. And if it's your will, God, bring back safely tomorrow night. We praise you, Jesus, and we thank you. 